good morning. We're going to start singing today. I do want to welcome you to Redeemer. It's good to see you all. Um, if you're in the back and you can hear me, follow my voice. We're going to do some singing. And uh, would you stand with me? Good morning. Be seated, please. Well, welcome to Redeemer Community Church. We're glad you're here this morning, and uh, let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, we uh, confess to you this morning we are prone to wanders. We just sang, but because of your goodness to us, you draw us back. We are secure in your love for us and in your work of salvation in us. Lord, and we thank you that uh, you have made us so that we may know you. Lord, your word says we're fearfully and wonderfully made, made a little lower than the angels, and that you've crowned us with glory and honor. Father, and you put a spirit within us, for we're made in your image, and you give us the breath of life, and you give us understanding and you give us the capability to know you, Lord, but it takes your regenerating work to do that. Lord, you've made us where we are capable of being your temple, the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we thank you for that. Father, we want to bring you glory both this morning and as we go forth with our bodies as well as our spirits, for you are, are our owner. 
Lord, and uh, you formed us so that we might declare your praise. And we ask that we might be able to do that this morning by the power of your Spirit. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, welcome. And if you're watching online, uh, welcome to you as well. Any visitors that we have with us this morning? If uh, you were recognized as a visitor, in other words, you were not recognized when you came in, you were probably recognized as a visitor, and if so, then you may have gotten one of these, a visitor card, and if you got one of those, we would be ever so grateful if you would uh, fill that out on the back. There's information, you can tell us about yourself, and you can also put any prayer requests you might have on there, and uh, you can put your email address on there, and if you fill that out, in that far corner where I'm pointing back there on that glass top table, the larger of those two wooden boxes, you can put that in there. For the rest of us, that's the, uh, the giving box where we put our tithes and offerings. And also for that smaller box for the rest of us, there's a prayer request card you can fill out and put in there as well. So avail yourself of that. We encourage you to do so. And we'd love to pray for you. And speaking of prayer, we would... Uh, the elders and wives uh, would appreciate your prayers later this week. We're uh, having a two-day getaway at the, last, uh, the end of the week. We're going to go talk about uh, what are the priorities that we need to look at as a church for this coming year. And if you would pray for that time, we would be grateful. And also, uh, if you get the newsletter, speaking of emails, then uh, you saw in there you could take a survey and you could tell us what you think are the top two or three things that we need to be addressing as a church this year. If you haven't done that, please uh, go back and do that before the end of the week, before uh, Thursday or Friday, certainly, and let us know because we'd really like to hear from you. So thank you for doing that. And speaking of priorities, we think one of those, um, one that we've been talking about for a while now, is um, possibly building a building. And we have been praying about that, and we want to keep in front of you the fact that uh, we need more funds in order to do that. Right now, we need probably at least $150,000 by the end of February. So if you'd continue to pray about that, pray the Lord would provide that, if that's what he would have us do. And if you can participate in that, that would be, uh, that'd be a wonderful thing as well. So if you'd keep doing that. Um, when you came in this morning, you saw in the uh, church lobby there a connections banner. And what the... Uh, that is for the last full week of the church to encourage, a gen it's a gentle reminder for the ladies to reach out and touch someone, as that old, uh, I think that was a, one of the phone company ads used to say, and do that and make a connection with another lady. Uh, maybe it's somebody who's new here, maybe it's a young mom that doesn't have the opportunity to get out much. It could be a shut-in, it could be somebody you just like to get to know better. But uh, we want to encourage the ladies to do that. That'll be uh, highlighted the last, that banner, you'll see it out there, the last full week of each month. And if you have any questions about that, you can see Marsha Cook or Lane Parrish or Cindy Fullenweider. But the point is to strengthen the relational fabric of Redeemer Community Church among the women. All right? One other ladies' announcement, a save the date. A women's Fellowship, it's going to be uh, the 15th, I believe that's a Monday, February the 15th, coming up. Probably going to be a dessert and coffee, 7 p.m. that evening. Uh, save the date, more details to come. The last few weeks we've been talking about telling our stories to others and doing that for the glory of God. And we're going to talk about that or hear more about that today. If you have spent any time in the Psalms, you know they are full of David telling his story telling this story how God's rescued him from uh, danger and trouble. I think I like that phrase he uses sometimes, the fowler's snare, how God saved him from the fowler's snare. And what we're going to do this morning before we worship in song, we are going to read together some selected verses, eight verses from Psalm 145, and it's where David is telling his story, and he's telling about the goodness and the greatness and the righteousness of God to the next generation, it says, and really to anyone who will listen, so that others may bless God, others may speak well of him. So let's stand up together and read, and we're going to bless God, we're going to speak well of him, and worship him this way before we do that in song. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. 
on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Amen. You can uh, remain standing. We're going to keep with our tradition here uh, that we've started this year. Uh, we're in question four of the New City Catechism. Um, so let's read, um, as we've just read from the Psalms, let's read another truth um, that, re that reminds us why God created us, all right? So I'm going to read the question here, and then if you all would join me in the answer. So how and why did God create us? God created us, male and female, in his own image, to know him, love him, live with him, and glorify him. And it is right that we who were created by God should live to his glory. Let's sing together. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Win this nation back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom here. We pray. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we may. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. Cause we are your church. Oh, and we need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst, we refuse to waste our lives for your our joy and prize. To see the captives' hearts released, the hurt, the sick, the poor at peace, we lay down our lives for heaven's cause. Cause we are your church. Oh, and we pray revive this earth. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness here show your mighty end. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire with this nation. your kingdom here we pray unleash your kingdom's power reaching the near and far no force of hell can stop your beauty changing hearts you made us for much more than this awake the kingdom seed in us fill us with the strength and love of Christ cause we are your church oh and we are the hope on earth build your kingdom here let the darkness fear show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land, set your church on fire, win this nation back, change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here, 
Build your kingdom. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church. Build your kingdom here, we pray. Amen. Let's continue worshiping in song. We're going to be singing, um, Bless the Lord. Hang on. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before Yeah. 
bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name, Lord. I your holy name Lord I worship your holy name You can be seated We want to take a minute and confess the reality of our sins to God to agree with him that what his word says about us is more true than what we often believe about ourselves. So bow with me and let's confess our sins to the Lord. Lord God, we confess to you this morning that uh, we want our lives to be uh, about us and our glory instead of being about you and your glory. Too often that's true of us. We confess that by nature we are children of wrath, sons and daughters of disobedience. We hear those words and we pull back and think, no, that's not me. I'm not full of wrath or disobedience. But you know our hearts even better than we do. Our hearts are corrupted. They're sick. They're deceitful. It's out of our hearts that evil thoughts and desires come. We often delight in darkness rather than light and there are things that we hate that we end up doing and things we don't do that we know we ought to do and when we do keep your word we become puffed up and proud of ourselves and yet your word says that our righteousness is like a filthy garment or a rag and when we have obeyed we've done only that which we should have done. We confess that we often think that we're better than other people like the older brother of the prodigal son did. Or we go to the other extreme and think that we have no worth or no value in spite of the fact that you've made us in your image and we're fearfully and wonderfully made, that you have loved us with an everlasting love. Lord, we confess we are broken people in need of redemption and we come to you grateful for your grace and your mercy and your transforming power and Lord we ask now that if there are specific sins that we have been harboring or sins that we've not been aware of that you might bring those to mind that they would come to the surface that we could confess them mercy on us, we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now stand and together let's hear again the good news. From Romans chapter 6, God says, if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For the one who died has been set free from sin. But now if we've died with Christ, we believe that by his grace we will also live with him. Thanks be to God. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me that all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Yeah. 
on uh, the gospel and its power in our lives uh, to change our lives and change our story. Um, we've been singing a new song, Come As You Are. So if you don't know it, just join in as you uh, become more familiar. sorrow that heaven can't heal cause earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal oh so lay down your burdens lay down your shame and all who are broken lift up your face oh wanderer come home you're not too far so lay down your hurt lay down your heart come as you are There's hope for the hopeless And all those who've strayed Come sit at the table Come taste the grace There's rest for the weary A rest that endures Cause earth has no sorrow That heaven can't cure Oh, so lay down your burden Lay down your shame 
and all who are broken lift up your face oh wanderer come home you're not too far so lay down your hurt so lay down your heart come as you are There's joy for the morning, O oh, sinner, be still. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Oh, so lay down your burdens, so lay down your shame. all who are broken lift up your face oh wanderer come home you're not too far so lay down your hurt lay down your heart come as you are of our mouth, the meditation of our heart would be acceptable in your sight. Lord, we pray that you are honored and glorified as we offer our praise to you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you're seated, take a minute, say hi to those around you, welcome them, greet them.
Okay, find your seats if you would, please. If you brought a Bible with you, and I hope you did, uh, I want you to turn to John chapter 4, which is where we're going to be spending a lot of our time this morning. As Mike said, we are returning to the subject of telling our story. We've been talking uh, this month about the fact that each of us has a story and that uh, our story of God's transforming work in our lives needs to be explored. We need to understand better what it is that God has done in our lives, and we need to uh, understand how God's bigger story of redemption overlays over our story and how our transformed life is a part of the evidence that God uh, uses to communicate to the world that the gospel is true. So we have a part to play in in the advancing of God's kingdom by exploring our story and by telling our story. And this morning I want to talk about the fact that telling our story and talking to other people about the gospel is an expectation that God expects that this is what we will do. It's his design for us, it's his desire for us, and it's an expectation. If you have surrendered your life to Jesus, telling other people about what Jesus has done in your life is something God has commanded for us to do. Now, I don't know if you've thought about that recently, but Jesus said, says one of the ways we respond to God's grace in our lives is by telling other people that good news. So the question comes up, uh, we're commanded to, so why don't we? Why is this something we don't do very often? I, uh, I was pondering that question this week and I decided to take it to the ultimate crowdsourcing site. I took it to Facebook and I just pasted it on Facebook. Why don't people share their faith more often than they do? And so I got a lot of responses. Here's what people said. One Facebook friend said, uh, people don't share their faith because they're afraid of rejection or they're afraid of being asked tough questions or they're afraid they're gonna offend somebody. In fact, one young man wrote to me and said, people my age don't wanna discuss anything potentially controversial or that someone might find offensive. He said, I've found when I try to lovingly share my faith, it's a great way to turn a conversation hostile. Maybe you've found that too. Uh, one person said, some people want to avoid confrontation. I remember my parents telling me, two things you never talk about in public, right? What is it? Politics and religion. It'll always end in a fight, they said. Some people don't share. This somebody wrote and said, they don't share because they're afraid of being labeled as discriminating against others. They're afraid they'll be called intolerant. Somebody said, the church culture, now this I thought was interesting, the church culture often seems to flatline the movement of the gospel in natural relational networks. In other words, church culture, he said, makes it feel unnatural to share the gospel or even have close friendships with people who aren't in the church. It's interesting that somehow this can get in the way of our reaching out beyond these walls. Somebody said, it's fear, not being confident in the power of the message, but confident in my ability, or, or not being confident in my ability to communicate. So I know these are lousy reasons, but it's true. And one person said, people don't share the good news with others because they don't really believe it's good news. Some people don't share because they're shy. Some people don't share because they feel like when they do, they're, they're becoming salespeople, trying to talk somebody into a product that they don't really want. And some of us don't share our faith because we're embarrassed by people we've seen sharing their faith. And we don't want to be one of those kind. We've watched TV and said, ugh. Or we've maybe walked by a street preacher and thought, that's not me. In fact, we went to the Independence Bowl this year where the University of Tulsa narrowly lost to Virginia Tech. And, and uh, we, we had a great time. This is the day after Christmas. We drove down to Shreveport. And as I'm walking up, to the game, to the stadium, there's a guy out in the parking lot with the bullhorn on his soapbox, and he's preaching the gospel. I listened for a minute, and it sounded like what he was preaching was biblically true. And I thought to myself, is anybody going to this game listening to him? Have seeds really been planted here? It, it will, will there be any fruit that comes from his labor, or was that just a, an exercise in futility? people who do the door-to-door -door thing. Some of us go, I could never do that. Just because the method that you've seen that you don't like or you don't feel comfortable with doesn't work doesn't mean that you don't do evangelism. Uh, apparently, 
there are still people who eat spaghetti out of a can. Okay, but just because I will never eat SpaghettiOs again does not mean that I don't like pasta, right? And just because one person's preference is not yours doesn't mean that you throw out the whole can. Some people don't share their faith because they say, I don't have the gift of evangelism. Now, let me just talk about the gift of evangelism for a second, okay? There was a, a researcher in the mid-90s who d came up with a spiritual gifts inventory. And when he uh, sampled this with a number of churches, he came back and he said, in most churches, there are about 10% of the people in that church who have the gift of evangelism, okay? Uh, but in 2010... George Barna did a survey and he asked, do you believe you have, <clears throat> excuse me, do you believe you have the gift of evangelism? And the number of people in the church who said, yes, I believe I have the gift of evangelism was 1%. It had gone from 10% down to 1% over 15 years. And in fact, it was, it had been 4% five years before that. Now, we can box up evangelism in a nice little compartment and we can say it's not my gift and think we can put it on the shelf. But the problem is Jesus doesn't say, if you have the gift of evangelism, go and make disciples. That, that qualifier is not on there. He doesn't say, if you have the gift of evangelism, uh, persuade others. No, the Bible says that we're all supposed to do this whether you have the gift of evangelism or not. Some people don't share their faith because they think that they've got a theological way around this. They think it doesn't really matter because God's sovereign. Off the hook, God's sovereign. He's going he's gonna to bring into the kingdom those who he's going to bring into the kingdom, whether I share my faith or not. And let me just say, I think that's true. If we quit talking, Jesus said, rocks and stones will do the job for us. That's not God's plan or design. That's available to him to get the job done, he will get the job done. But his design, his assignment, and by the way, the privilege and the joy that comes with that is something that he's entrusted to us. I don't know if you've had the experience of being there when somebody is born into the kingdom. You've been in the delivery room when somebody trusts Christ. It's a joyful experience. It's a privilege. It's an honor. And yet we go, I don't know if I want to do that. Uh, R.C. Sproul tells the story. He was in a classroom uh, when he was an undergraduate, and one of his professors raised the question in the class. He said, okay, if God is sovereign when it comes to salvation, if he knows all, if he's all loving, all kind, and all powerful, why witness? And the class was silent. Nobody raised it. Nobody, nobody said anything. Sproul said, finally, after several students said, I don't know, Sproul raised his hand, and he said, well, one small reason that we ought to be concerned with evangelism is that Christ commanded us to do evangelism. And the professor said, oh, I see, Mr. Sproul, one small reason why you ought to do this is that your Savior, the Lord of glory, the King of kings, has commanded it. That's a small reason? Sproul quickly got the point and wished he'd never used the word small, right? But the fact that God has commanded us to share our faith ought to be enough. It ought to be more than a grudging duty for us as Christians. This is a great privilege that God has given us to be a part of the greatest work in history, the work of redemption. One Facebook friend said, we don't share with others because we take the pressure of success in conversion and we put it on ourselves. We believe it's our job to convince others into the kingdom. Therefore, if somebody doesn't respond, rather than trusting in the sovereignty of God to do the work that only he can do, we feel as if we've failed. Our job is to sow. It's God's job to do the rest. And by the way, I did. You, you will see if you read the scripture that evangelism is better than a pedicure. That's what Isaiah said. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, right? Sharing the gospel is good for your feet. Who publishes peace brings good news of happiness. Who publishes salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. One one more note that came on Facebook. I thought this was interesting. Somebody said, I think every believer needs to take the time to write their story, their testimony. Needs to give God the glory, not be an egotistical recounting of all their trials and tribulations, but genuinely how God has worked in their lives. It needs to focus on relationships, not religion, especially drop the Christianese stuff. If folks could have a short few minute story to share, it could be a seed that's planted to bring others to the Father. And I thought, hmm, 
That sounds like an assignment that all of you have that is due next Sunday. Next Sunday, okay? So this morning, we're going to look at the familiar account found in the Gospel of John where Jesus had an interaction with a woman from Samaria at Jacob's well in Sychar, and she became persuaded of the fact that he is the Messiah. And we'll see as we look at this account what we can learn about how we tell our story and seeing how Jesus engaged with this woman. And rather than reading through the chapter, as we often do, as we most often do, we're going to show a scene from the life of Jesus. This is about five minutes long, Jesus and the woman at the well. This is from a movie called The Gospel of John. And one of the things I like about this particular movie version is that the, the words in the film are only words of scripture. So you're going to see what is as true to scripture as a filmmaker could get. Now, one of the other things I like about this film, just to be honest with you, is the person who plays Jesus is Henry Ian Cusick. If you're a fan of Lost, he was Desmond on Lost, okay? So I hope that doesn't ruin it for any of you Lost folks to go, that's Desmond, but this is Jesus and the woman at the well. So let's kill the lights. It's about five minutes long. We'll watch Jesus and the woman at the well. In Samaria, he came to a town named Sychar, which was not far from the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by the trip, sat down by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw some water. Give me a drink of water. His disciples had gone into town to buy food. You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. So how can you ask me for a drink? Jews will not use the same cups and bowls that Samaritans use. If you only knew what God gives, and who it is that is asking you for a drink, you would ask him. And he would give you a life-giving water. Sir, you don't have a bucket and the well is deep. Where would you get that life-giving water? It was our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well. He and his children and his flocks all drank from it. You don't claim to be greater than Jacob, do you? Those who drink this water will get thirsty again. But those who drink the water that I will give them will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring, which will provide them with life-giving water and give them eternal life. Sir, give me that water. Then I will never be thirsty again. Nor will I have to come here to draw water. Go and call your husband and come back. I don't have a husband. You are right when you say you don't have a husband. You have been married to five men and the man you live with now is not really your husband. You have told me the truth. I see you are a prophet, sir. My Samaritan ancestors worshipped God on this mountain. But you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place where we should worship God. Believe me, woman. The time will come when people will not worship the Father either on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans do not really know whom you worship. But we Jews know whom we worship because it is from the Jews that salvation comes. But the time is coming. And is already here. When by the power of God's Spirit, people will worship the Father as he really is, offering him the true worship that he wants. God is Spirit. And only by the power of his Spirit can people worship him as he really is. I know that the Messiah will come. And when he comes, he will tell us everything. I am he. I, who am talking with you. At that moment, Jesus' disciples returned, and they were greatly surprised to find him talking with a woman. But none of them said to her, what do you want? Or asked him, why are you talking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the town. Oh, 
come and see the man who told me everything I've ever done. Could he be the Messiah? So they left the town and went to Jesus. In the meantime, the disciples were begging Jesus, teacher, have something to eat. But he answered, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. So the disciples started asking among themselves, could somebody have brought him food? My food is to obey the will of the one who sent me and to finish the work he gave me to do. You have a saying, four more months and then the harvest. But I tell you, take a good look at the fields. The crops are now ripe and ready to be harvested. The one who reaps the harvest is being paid and gathers the crops for eternal life. So the one who plants and the one who reaps will be glad together. For the saying is true. Someone plants, someone else reaps. I have sent you to reap the harvest in a field where you did not work. Others work there. And you profit from their work. Many of the Samaritans in that town believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they begged him to stay with them. And Jesus stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his message. And they told the woman, we believe now, not because of what you said, but because we ourselves have heard him and we know that he really is the savior of the world. That's a powerful moment in the life of Jesus and I want us to, you can turn the lights back up, I want us to uh, go back through John chapter four and focus our intention on the interaction between Jesus and this woman and see what we can learn about how Jesus dialogued with her. And I'm gonna make 10 observations from John chapter 4, and we'll walk back through it as we do. Uh, and I hope these observations help all of us think about sharing our own story. First observation is that Jesus went to where she was, which sounds pretty obvious, but if you know the account, you know that uh, uh, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom had been divided for many years uh, a after the, uh, Solomon had reigned as king, and the north and the south didn't get along. The 10 tribes in the north and the two tribes in the south, there had been a division between them. And so in the south, you had Judea. In the north, you had Galilee, and in between them was Samaria. And Samaria was this place where there had been uh, race mingling, race mixing, and the Jews thought the Samaritans were apostates and they wouldn't have anything to do with them. And that's where this controversy, our fathers say this, your fathers say that, it's all a part of that. Many Orthodox Jews, if they wanted to go from Judea in the south to Galilee in the north, would not go through Samaria because it was considered unclean to go through Samaria and because it was dangerous to go through Samaria. So they would often go around the Jordan River and go up on the Transjordan side where they wouldn't have to step foot in Samaria. Jesus took the quicker route, but it was also the, the road less traveled, if you will. He took the route that took him into Samaria and that brought him face to face with this woman. Jesus went to where she was. Now I say that because if we're going to share our story, if we're going to do evangelism, we have to go to where people who need to hear the gospel are. Back a few weeks ago when I started this, I, I told you that it's one of the challenges that I've got is that I don't routinely wind up with people who are unbelievers. I spent a lot of time with you guys, I spent a lot of time at Family Life, and so far I haven't found a lot of unbelievers in either place. And I think that's a good thing, but you gotta find a way to go where people are. Some of you know that a little more than a year ago, my wife decided that she wanted to take tap dancing lessons. Did you know this? She has been taking tap for about a year, and I've told her that one morning during the sermon, I want a tap demonstration. She's so far refusing to do that, but but uh, she has loved going out and taking tap dancing lessons. And she, she did it to take tap, but she realized in the midst of it that she was crossing paths with a lot of folks who don't go to church regularly. And there were opportunities for conversation to come up in the midst of tap dancing to talk about just real life, what's going on, and somebody who was going to the hospital or somebody who had this issue or somebody who had a loved one who was dying. She's had the opportunity just to plant small seeds just by saying, can I pray for you? Or, uh, I'm sorry for your loss. Been thinking about you, praying for you. 
If there's any way I can help, let me know. These are the kinds of things that we can do to be um, to be engaging with folks. But to do it, you got to be where folks are. So I think it's important for us to think strategically. How do we get to where folks are? That's the first thing we see from Jesus. Second thing, Jesus engaged this woman by talking about a common interest. In this case, the common interest was water. Give me a drink. He could have, by the way, ignored her. When she came, she, she could have put the bucket down, gotten her water, gone. It was, in fact, more socially appropriate for them not to speak to one another. Jew, Samaritan, man, woman, alone at the well. There were lots of reasons why ignoring her was the right thing to do socially, but Jesus brought up a common subject. She had a jug. He said, I could use some water. Would you get me some water? Uh, some of you know that if you are a Christian, and I don't know why, why we, we think this, but if, if you're a Christian, apparently one of the things that comes with your conversion is if you're ever on an airplane, you're supposed to witness to the person next to you on the airplane. You know that, right? It's just I, somehow it's in our DNA that we're supposed to talk to strangers on airplanes about Jesus. Uh, I have had, I, I do a lot of traveling. I do, uh, I, I've had limited opportunity to talk to anybody spiritually. <laughs> I, was, I was watching Matt Chandler in preparation for this. He says, it's all, he says it works great for him. He says he'll sit down on an airplane next to somebody and, and he'll say to that person, what do you do? And the person will say, I'm a banker. And he'll, they'll say, what do you do? And he says, I'm a preacher. And then the next thing he says, so you know what we're going to have to talk about, right? I mean, I have to. I mean, I'm a preacher. So he said it just opens the door for him. But oftentimes on airplanes, um, I'm, I want to get some work done. So I put on my noise-canceling headphones, and that's my signal, don't talk to me, I'm not talking to you, and we'll all be happy on this flight, okay? <laughs> now, I'm not saying that's the right thing to do. I'm just saying that oftentimes that's where my focus is. But I've also had opportunity, whether it's on an airplane or whether it's in a social setting or where I'm meeting folks, to begin conversations, and what I'm often looking for are areas of commonality, right? When you're meeting somebody new, what do you do? Where are you from? Where'd you grow up? You're looking for things that you can share in common. So somebody says, I'm from Portland. And I would say, so do you eat voodoo donuts? Because voodoo donuts are big in Portland, right? I'm, I'm looking for something that I know about their community or something that I can engage with them in conversation around. And a big reason for that is so that you can see where that conversation takes you and whether you have the opportunity to turn it. Here's the third thing about Jesus. He engaged her by asking for a favor. I think this is interesting. I, I think this goes both ways. I think you can engage people by offering to serve. In Jesus' case, he engaged her by asking her to serve him, by asking if she would help with something. And that's a great engagement opportunity. Uh, from the context of serving one another, relationships are formed and opportunities there thrive. Here's the fourth thing. He stunned her by his disregard for social customs in speaking to her. He easily and willingly stepped over cultural barriers. The Samaritan woman, you remember, said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask me for a drink, a woman from Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Most of us are part of the majority culture in the United States. Most of us are upper to middle class white folks. We're well educated, but our understanding of God's word informs us that we, we see that all men and women are created with equal worth and dignity. All of them are created, all of us are created as image bearers of God. And so it should not be part of our thinking or part of our nature for there to be any class, gender, or racial dis, uh, distinctions that would keep us from talking to somebody else. We ought to be the most engaging folks with folks from every socioeconomic group. And by the way, when, when you cross those bridges to talk to somebody, there, there's often a, uh, a genuine interest in why you would care about them because they're not used to folks in the majority culture caring about them. And, and I'll just say this, we ought to be examining our own hearts because I think there are hidden prejudices in our own hearts things that we're not even aware of that have been developed over time that uh, can result in, in subtle senses of pride or superiority. I feel this, you know, when, I, when I'll come across somebody who is less well-educated than I am or somebody who is, is, 
is more blue collar than I am or something and I'll just they're just little prejudices that pop up there some some rural redneck and I'll just feel a sense of superiority to them I'm just being honest we've got to acknowledge that recognize that weed it out kill it and and God calls us to love and serve all people and that's a part of the transformed heart Here's the fifth thing I see in this. Jesus didn't preach, but he did find a way to steer the conversation in a spiritual direction. So she said, he says, give me a drink. And she says, why are you even talking to me? And he says to her in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now he's being shrewd here in talking a little mysterious. He's not just He's not just laying out the whole sermon. He doesn't just take her right and go, oh, I've got an, op an opportunity here and start preaching to her. But he just says, you know, if you knew what was going on here, uh, you, you would uh, ask me to give you a drink. And she said, everybody who drinks, or in, in verse 13, he, he keeps it going where he says, everybody who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Whoever drinks the water I'll give him will never be thirsty. The water I will give him become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So, he takes the conversation about water and he turns it to spiritually and he sees if she responds to that and she does. When he says something spiritual, she responds to it. We have the same opportunity in all kinds of conversations just to stop and think, is there a way to take this spiritually, to, to, to turn this conversation spiritually? And in this current climate, if you were talking about people and you're talking about the events of the day, what what two things are on people's mind? If you watched the news yesterday, what were the two big stories? Snowstorm. What's the other one? The elections, politics, Iowa. Okay. So somebody's talking to you about, man, did you see the the record snow that's being dumped on the Northeast? And it's easy to say something. Now this this can sound corny. You got to figure out how to do this without sounding corny. But just to say. You know, I'm sure glad that there's a God who controls the weather and knows what he's doing. Okay? It's a real simple statement. See if anybody picks up. Somebody might come back and say, you know, I think this has more to do with uh, the ozone layer than it does with God. Right? Okay. That's a good conversation to start having. Why? So, so do you believe there is a God who has anything to do with the weather? Or do you think it's just all us? You're into a spiritual conversation. Politics. So don't talk about, I'm suggesting when politics comes up, turn it to religion. I mean, turn it to, if. <laughs> but somebody comes up and says, this politician, that politician, if, if this person gets elected, I'm moving to Canada. You hear these kinds of things, right? And, and I think it's really easy to say, you know, I'm really grateful that, that, um, that God's care over me is a, a whole lot more important than whatever the government decides, Right? That, uh, that God has more power than, than any government. Whether it's good kings or bad kings, there's still a great king who's in control of it all. It's just a way to, to subtly, well, that may not be so subtle, it's just a way to, to kind of move the conversation in a spiritual direction. That's what Jesus did. Number six, he carefully and gently opened a door to address her real need, which is forgiveness. He talked with her about the sin in her life, not to shame her. And even though he was not a sinner himself, he didn't, he didn't present this as the I'm better than you are scenario. But he opened the door to talking about her sin. Go get your husband. And in asking that, she could have lied. She didn't. She told the truth. I have no husband. And then he revealed that he knew more than that. And he, uh, in the process of this, he's bringing up the subject of her need for forgiveness. Now, this is tricky. This is not something that is often easily done in a casual conversation at the water cooler or even with the person on the airplane. Although I will tell you, I've had some airplane conversations where people have gotten into, uh, maybe it's the fact that they know they're never going to see you again, that they'll just tell you some of their junk, right? But this is one of those tricky things in sharing with Jesus about others. One of the things we need to do is help them see the reality of their spiritual condition apart from, from Jesus, their need for a Savior. 
but you have to find a way to do it in a way that does not bring about shame and in a way that doesn't doesn't evidence some kind of self-righteousness. You do that and, and the conversation is shut down. So Jesus, by the way, does not shame her in the midst. He, he makes the fact that you speak truly. You've had five husbands. The one you're with today is not your husband. He doesn't say, you wench, right? And with the woman caught in adultery, he doesn't say to her, I condemn you. In fact, he says, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. So there is this, we've got to find this way to communicate the reality. And, and let me just say this, by the way, when you meet people who aren't Christians and you find out that they are sinners, this should not come as news to you. Okay? Because when you meet people who are Christians, you know that they're sinners. Here's the difference. Christians should know that they're sinners. Non-Christians don't recognize it. They think they're just doing what people do. And so when you hear about their sin, you know, you're sitting down to somebody, you, you sit down with somebody on the airplane and they, you know, they're kind of, uh, uh, they got a headache and you go, you okay? And they go, yeah, man, I just, I got ripped last night, man. I got a hangover. I just got wasted last night. You should not kind of move aside and go, don't let any of that get off on me, right? No, it should not surprise you that, that a non-Christian goes out and gets drunk. That's what a lot of non-Christians do. And so for you to acknowledge that and not to bring shame to bear in the midst of that, you know they have a need, but their need is not to get sober. Their need is to find Jesus. Okay? J.C. Ryle says, no one values the physician until he feels the disease. And just as with the woman caught in adultery, Jesus doesn't sidestep the issue of sin, but he doesn't shame or condemn either. In fact, John 3.17, the verse that comes after the one we all know, John 3.16, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Now there is a day coming when God will send his son into the world to condemn the world. But that was not the first coming of Jesus to bring condemnation. The first coming of Jesus was to offer salvation. And what our job is, is to extend that offer before the day of condemnation arrives. This is not the day of condemnation. This is the day of salvation. Here's the seventh thing from this passage. Jesus sidestepped secondary issues to stay focused on the main issue. She wanted to get off into, should we worship here or there? And, and kind of territory, verse 19, the woman said, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Here's my theological question for you. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. You say Jerusalem is the place. Jesus sidesteps that or takes that question and steers her back to the main issue which is the hour is coming when neither this mountain or Jerusalem will be the place you worship the Father. He says I'm not going to get off into that theological mess with you. So you're sitting down with somebody and you're talking about Jesus and they say yeah well Christians are crazy because they believe the earth is 6,000 years old. Okay. The wrong thing to do in that situation is to get into a discussion about the age of the earth. If you go in, well, wait, the fossil record, the flood, you don't know what the, you know, you're headed in the wrong direction. That person does not need to be converted to a young earth view. That person needs to be converted to their need for a savior. That's what they need to understand. Somebody sits down to you and say, I could never be a Christian because of the way Christians treat gays. Okay? Your job is not to go off. You, you can take that and say, you know what? I agree with you. I've seen a lot of Christians who have shamefully treated a lot of homosexuals poorly. Homosexuals are people who are created in God's image and they deserve his grace and love just like everybody else. But that's not the real issue here. The real issue is not how Christians treat homosexuals, but about your relationship with God. You gotta keep coming back to the main issue. And so you say things like, you know, I think the issues that you're raising here are not unimportant issues, but ultimately they're secondary issues. Here's what I think is the main issue. Do you believe Jesus is who he claimed to be? Do you think the Bible's true? See, it's a simple turn like that. What you're bringing up here, that's not an unimportant issue. But I think the bigger issue is, do you believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be? And you'll sit down with some people who would say something like, I could never serve a God who, and then they fill in whatever their issue is. I could never serve a God. And, and so to say to that person, have you ever read the Bible to see what it says about who God is? Would you be interested in going through a book of the Bible with me and let's together explore 
if, if the God of the Bible is real and whether you can serve him or not? See, it's just taking him back to the main issue. That's number seven. Here's number eight. Jesus addressed her worship issue. Remember, she's talking about our fathers say this, uh, we should worship here and there. And Jesus went to the worship issue by saying, you worship what you don't know, we worship what we do know. Salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Here's what Jesus is doing here. He's acknowledging that all people are worshipers. You know that, right? Everybody worships something. Bob Dylan said it. you got to serve somebody. Everybody worships somebody. Everybody serves something. We are made to worship. The thing is, we believe that there is something, all of us believe there's something that has ultimate worth. And we give our time, our attention, our money, our focus to whatever we think has ultimate earth, worth. So everybody in the room, everybody out there believes something has ultimate value and worth. They may think, the Samaritans, they thought their ethnic heritage was what was ultimately valuable. We come here to worship because we're Samaritans. Jacob gave us this well. We're proud of our heritage. That's what's deriving their worship. For people today, what often drives their worship is comfort. I am going to do, I'm going to give my life, I'm going to give my time, my effort, my money to that which will ultimately give me comfort at the end of the day. For other people, it's pleasure or it's success or it's recognition, or it's happiness. There are all kinds of things that people think give life ultimate meaning and worth. What we have to do is we have to help people understand that ultimate meaning and worth in life comes through joy, and joy is found in the presence of God. What God created us for is joy. Not happiness, but joy. He created us for a deep, internal satisfaction, peace, and, and comfort that comes from knowing him. That's what everybody's ultimately scratching for. And when we can help people see that, Jesus is saying, you're, you're focused on the externals of worship. I'm going to take you to the heart of worship, which is spirit and truth. Not what mountain or what, what uh, tradition but it's from uh, its spirit and truth. In fact, that's number nine, and it's kind of tied to this. Jesus is moving her from external works-based religion to a relationship to her heart, a relationship with God. So different ways of saying the same thing. He's saying rather than, uh, than pursuing an idol here, pursue God, and, and he's also saying that these externals aren't the way that you get to God. And here's the tenth thing. Ultimately, he did address the main issue head on. So the woman says to him, I know the Messiah is coming. He who's called the Christ, when he speaks, will know all things. And Jesus said, I who speak to you am he. he. He brings the issue to the fact that he is the Messiah. That's ultimately at the core of what we share. I had spoken at a weekend to remember marriage getaway in Washington, D.C. a number of years ago. And I, about halfway through the, the weekend to remember, we shared the gospel. We talk about Jesus death, burial, and resurrection, and how Jesus said he is the only way that a man can be right with God. And I was walking out of having given that talk, and I ran into a woman who pulled me aside. She said, could I talk to you? I said, yes. She said, uh, she said I'm Jewish. She said, I called ahead, and they said this conference would be good for me, even though I'm Jewish. And I said, I'm in trouble. That's what I said it to myself. I didn't say it to her. But I said, I said, have you found the conference helpful so far? She said, until the last session, yes. And she said, it sounded in there like you were saying that Jesus is the only way that a person can get to God. And I thought to myself, good, I was clear, okay? It's <laughs> the first thing I thought, all right, so. And she said, I'm Jewish. That's not what we believe. And I said, let me, let me just say, I'm glad you found the conference to, to your liking until the last session. I said, and I want you to know that we do offer an unconditional money back guarantee. So if for any reason you want your money back from this conference, we'll give it to you. I said, but I don't think your argument's really with me. She said, what do you mean? I said, I think your argument's with Jesus. Jesus is the one who declared for himself, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. I said, so Jesus said that. 
you have to decide whether you think Jesus was lying, whether he was crazy, or whether what he says has any merit to it. So I'm not trying to offend you. I have great respect for Jewish people and for the Jewish faith. But you're going to have to wrestle with this statement from Jesus and decide what you believe about it. That was the end of our conversation. Now, that was not a comfortable conversation to have, right? But if you're going to have any kind of a gospel interaction with somebody, you ultimately have to get there. You have to get to the fact that Jesus said this about how we can know God. So those are my 10 observations about Jesus communicating with this woman at the well and how that affects our communication with others. Let me just point out a few other things from this chapter. First of all, what was the first thing this woman did after her encounter with Jesus? Look at verse 28. The woman left her water jar, which is why she came to the well in the first place, went into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they came out of town and were coming to him. She went and told others. It's a natural response to good news to share good news with others. If you get good news, it is natural to want to share your good news with others. When somebody says what's going on in your life, if you had good news, if, you're, if you have a child who just had a baby, you say, we're really, really excited. Our daughter just had a baby. That's good news. You share that with others. One of my Facebook friends said perhaps one reason we don't share our faith is because we're not totally in love with Jesus. She said, when, it, when he is our life, our everything, we will echo the words of Peter and John in Acts 4.20. They said, we cannot but speak the things we've seen and heard. We don't have any choice. We, we got to talk about this. The more we know, this person wrote, the more I know and love my Savior, the more I love others, and I long for them to know the joy and the peace I've found in Jesus. So this woman, as soon as she, she believes this man is at least a prophet, maybe the Messiah, could he be? She runs to town to tell others. We guard our tongue. Look carefully at the conversation Jesus had with his disciples after they returned. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, this is verse 31. The disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. He said to them, I have food to eat that you don't know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Jesus says, More important than food, and we all know how important food is, right? More important than food is to do the will of the Father. Some of you have already been thinking, during the sermon, you've been thinking about lunch. I understand that, okay? But Jesus says the more important thing is to do the will of the Father. And then he goes back and tell them, tells them they're a part of that work as well. Verse 35, don't you say there are four months, then comes the harvest? Look, look up your eyes. See that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and other reaps. I've sent you to reap for that which you do not labor. Others have labored, you've entered into their labor. Notice he says, I've sent you to reap. Jesus says, I expect you to be a part of the harvest. This is, this is why I'm here. This is why you're here as my followers. Obviously, he's using this planting and sowing and reaping and the harvest metaphor for the picture of God's kingdom. We do that every Thanksgiving when we sing those hymns, Come Ye Thankful People, Come, Raise the Song of Harvest Home. We recognize that the harvest in our world is a picture of God's ultimate harvest, bringing in the ripe grain. I want to share some thoughts on this interchange between Jesus and the disciples. Thoughts from Tim Keller, and I'm going to put these up on the screen as we do this. Keller says, first of all, he says, what is harvesting? It's this. It's confronting someone with their need for Christ and then confronting them with the provision of Christ in order to bring them into eternal life. That's harvesting. It's helping somebody see their need and then introducing them to Jesus. That's what we're all called to do. For a Christian to say, I love Jesus and I love the gospel, but I'm just not into sharing my faith. Keller says it's like a person who says, I love ice cream, but I don't like things that are frozen. Okay, He says... If you take away frozenness, you have something, but you don't have ice cream anymore. And in the same way, if you take away sharing your faith from Christianity, you have something, but you don't have Christianity anymore. In 
fact, Keller says it this way, a Christianity that doesn't have conversion and evangelism as part of it is something, but it's not Christianity. He goes on to say, Jesus Christ clearly demands in this passage again and again and again that we do this one little thing. He calls it harvesting. And he says, until you know the joy of harvesting, you don't know what it means to live a satisfying life. Keller says, a lot of us are dying because of a lack of a mission. For many of you, your biggest mission in life is to make enough money so you can pay the rent next month and keep your lifestyle where you want it to be. As a result, Keller says, I believe many of our souls are shriveling up because they were built for something more noble and more heroic than that. Now, if you're going to be a part of the harvest, it is smart for a harvester to look around for ripe fruit. Okay, So how do you know, as you go through your daily work, how do you know if fruit is ripe or if it's not ripe? When you're interacting with people, how do you know if they're ripe to be talked to or not ripe to be talked to? Well, I'm going to give you some just some suggestions. And I want you to apply these this week as you go through your life. Here's the first suggestion. Are there people reaching out to you for friendship or interaction? If so, they are ripe for the harvest. If people are coming your way looking for interaction, if people are trying to engage you in conversation or if they're coming up to you and saying, could I have lunch with you? Or if they're, if they're trying to engage you, they're probably ripe for the beginning. Second thing is, do you know anybody who's hurting right now? Anybody who's facing a challenge or confused about their life? Do you know something? somebody who's in any kind of turmoil? Offer help to that person. Find a book that is a Christian book that addresses their need and buy it for them. That's just a way you can help somebody. So somebody who has uh, just lost their job, find a book, and you can find these books, on how to deal with the the pain of losing a job from a Christian perspective. And buy a copy and say, I know you're going through this right now. I wanted to give you something to help. Finding hurting people is one way you look for ripe, ripe fruit. In fact, for years, we've recognized at Family Life that adult evangelism happens best in the midst of two circumstances, marriages that are in trouble or parents who have prodigals. When marriages are in trouble or people have prodigals, they will often pull back and re-examine all of the foundational aspects of their life and say, everything I thought I believed, I'm, I'm not sure what to make of it. And they're open to hearing the gospel in those moments. And here's, here's the simplest thing you can do to begin a spiritual conversation with somebody. You can do this with the waitress. I've done this with the waitress at a restaurant. She will come and deliver the food, and I will say to her, I don't do this often, but I've... I've been prompted by the Lord at times to say, we're about to pray for our meal. Is there anything we could pray for you about? Just offer to pray for somebody. It's real simple. We're about to say a prayer for our meal. Is there anything we could pray for you about? And you'll be amazed at what a waitress will tell you about her life and ask you to pray about. If you do that, tip generously, okay? <laughs> Don't offer to pray and then stiff her on the tip. Now, most of you know that I'm not a big fan of what are called seeker-sensitive churches. You've heard about seeker-sensitive churches where the church is really built around trying to reach seekers. And there are a lot of reasons that I'm not going to get into right now, but I will tell you this, most seeker-sensitive churches do a better job of evangelism than we do. Most seeker-sensitive churches are better than most Bible reform, theologically grounded churches at evangelism. I think a lot of seeker pastors are pastors who have the gift of evangelism. God's gifted them with that, and they take their energy and they take it to start a church that they want to reach people with. Bill Hybels is one of those guys. Willow Creek Community Church is one of the grandfathers of seeker churches, and Bill Hybels is an evangelist. It's really clear anytime you're with him. He wrote a book a number of years ago called Becoming a Contagious Christian. And in that book, he said there are six different styles of evangelism or of harvest work. And I'm going to go through these six styles with you real quickly before we come to the Lord's table because I want you to ask yourself the question as we go through them, which of these styles sounds most like me? So the first style is the confrontational or the direct style. This is the person who is very comfortable taking somebody right to the gospel from, from zero to 60 in two seconds. 
I've been with people like this who have no, they, they have no reservation about saying to somebody, have you ever stopped to consider uh, your relationship with Jesus? Supermarket checkout, taxi driver, wherever. These are, these are people who are on fire evangelists. Ray Comfort, if you know that name, Ray Comfort is a guy like this, right? Billy Graham is a guy like this. Bill Bright was a guy like this. I shared a taxi ride with Bill Bright one time, and I just waited to see if he was going to turn the conversation with the driver. He did. He talked to everybody about Jesus. It's the direct approach. If you've ever been a part of Campus Crusade, when you go on beach projects in spring break, that's what you do, the confrontational approach. You go up and talk to people on the breach, uh, on the, in the breach maybe, on the beach. You try to get them before they're in the breach and talk to them on the beach and say, let's talk about, uh, about Jesus. So that's one style. Here's the second, the invitational style. The invitational style is a type of evangelism that focuses on inviting people to an event or something where they can hear about Jesus. So if you ever said to somebody, would you want to go to church with me sometime? That's an invitational style of evangelism. Or our church is having an event, would you like to come? Or uh, I'm going to a concert, would you like to come? That's an invitational style. I know people who have become Christians because a friend invited them to a concert or to a movie or to church. That's a style of evangelism. Uh, it's, the, it's the Samaritan woman who said, come and see. She was inviting them back to see Jesus. Peter did this, or Andrew did this with Peter, and uh, Philip did it with Nathaniel. Come and see. There's a third style, testimonial style. This is where you share your story. We're trying to equip everybody to be able to do this. Everybody should be able to do it. The high-profile testimonial folks are the athletes or the, uh, the, the movie stars or the people who, have, who share their faith in Christ, and they can give a testimonial about their life. In fact, Billy Graham, when he would do crusades, would often have some high-profile celebrity-type person who would get up and share his story. Uh, some of you have read the book Unbroken. Well, Louis Zamperini in that book came to faith at a Billy Graham crusade in 1949. Ten years later, Billy Graham had him back at a crusade to share his testimony with everybody else. Sharing your story. Fourth way is relational. We've heard a lot about what's called lifestyle evangelism or friendship evangelism. This is the relational approach. It's often a, a slow, steady building of relationships where you're building them for the joy of the relationship not merely for the opportunity to share the gospel but it's in that context that you earn the right to be able to go to a friend and say I want to talk to you about something that's very important to me and because you have friendship and equity with somebody you can do that then number five is the intellectual style this is what Paul did on Mars Hill where he engaged the philosophers and you know people who like Josh McDowell or people like Robbie Zacharias people like uh, Lee Strobel or Tim Keller, they can get right into the intellectual middle of it all and they can, they can debate uh, all kinds of philosophical, theological kinds of issues. And then six is the service style of evangelism. This is where you open the door to sharing your faith by meeting the real needs of people in your world. So this is the approach that Compassion International takes when they go into a third world country and offer to help people's physical needs and share the gospel. This is what we do with the shoe boxes that we send out at Christmas. We Samaritan's Purse, that's the approach. It's a service approach that then comes along and offers the gospel. Now those are six. Have you got the one that's yours? Maybe there are two of them up there that you'd say, this is probably my style. The point is, you don't have to do it the way that you caricature. We don't all have to be confrontational. Some of you may be, that's fine. But if you're not, there are other ways that you can share the gospel. Somebody said to D.L. Moody one time, a woman came up to him and criticized him, said, I don't, I don't like your method of evangelism. And Moody said, I agree with you. I don't like it either. He said, tell me, how do you do it? And she said, well, I don't do it. And Moody said, well, I like the, my way of doing it better than your way of not doing it. <laughs> so you can look at this and say, I, I don't like the way so-and-so does it. Fine. What's your way? And it all comes back around to why is it that we share our faith in the first place? Well, for that, we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You don't have to turn there. But Paul says, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Recognizing who God is 
and what he's required of us, we persuade others. And then he goes on to say, for the love of Christ constrains us. What is it that, that constrains us or compels us or controls our behavior so that we share with others? It's the love of Christ. How can you know the love of Christ and not share with others? And that's why we come back every week to reminding ourselves of the love of Christ because what compels or constrains or controls us is what's pictured here at this table behind me, the death and resurrection of Jesus. The fact that Jesus was willing to set aside his divine prerogative in heaven. You remember last week when Mike took us to Revelation chapter 7 into the throne room? I mean, if that's where you lived, you would never leave. But Jesus left. He left his Father's throne above and came to earth, dwelt among us, lived as one of us, ultimately was beaten, spat upon, and put to death. Why? Because he loves us. The love of Christ for us is what constrains us to share good news with other people. And so we want to reflect in these final moments of our service on God's great love for us, which is seen clearly in the death and resurrection of Jesus. If you're here this morning as a visitor, we want you to know that this coming forward and taking the bread and the juice, this is what we call communion. Communion is something that the church has been doing for 2,000 years because Jesus said, when you gather, remember me and do this. This is for those who have given their lives to Jesus, those who have said, he is king, lord, ruler, and master. He is God. And so we come and remind ourselves of his love for us because it empowers us and controls us and constrains us to live for him. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, don't come and receive the bread and the juice. We're not trying to keep something from you. We're just trying to follow the instruction of Christ here. If you're here this morning as a visitor and you do know and love Christ, you're welcome at the table because all who have turned their life over to him are welcome. You take a few minutes and consider what we've talked about here this morning. You prepare your hearts to come while I prepare the table.
Bible says that God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still rebels, sinners, Christ died for us. On the night before he died for us, he had the Passover feast with his disciples, and that night he took the bread. After he had prayed a prayer of blessing, he broke it. He said, this bread is my body broken for you. As often as you receive this, he said, remember me. They'd not yet seen his body broken, but the next day they would see his broken body hung on a cross. And so, Lord, this morning as we receive this cracker, we receive it remembering that your body was indeed broken for us, that you were hung on a cross to die for our sin, that God made you, the one who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be his righteousness. We can't comprehend, but we receive now this bread grateful that you have done a transforming work in our lives. We receive it with grateful hearts as we feast on Christ in our hearts. Amen. In the same way, after the meal was concluded, Jesus took the cup, and after he had blessed it, he passed it and said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant, the covenant of my blood shed for the remission of sins. As often as you receive this, remember me. And so, Lord, this morning, as we take this cup, we think about your shed blood, the blood that paid the price for our sin, the blood that makes us clean, the blood that has paid the price we owe so that we can be sons and daughters of the Most High. We rejoice in that, and we feast on Christ in our hearts as we receive this now with grateful hearts. If you'll put up the last word, the words to that last verse of Jesus paid it all, when before the throne I stand in him complete. Let's sing that again. And if you'll stand, and then I'll dismiss us with a benediction. Father, the love of Jesus, the Son, and the power of the Holy Spirit abide with you as you go from this place. Go with good news for others. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>